<coughs> excuse me from different parts of the world a very warm welcome to all of you i am shobha shukla from cns and it it is indeed an honor and pleasure for me to moderate this very important global media forum in the lead up to world antimicrobial awareness week 2021 or wav as we generally call it that is observed every year from november 18 to november 24 this session is being organized by cns and co-hosted by asia pacific media alliance for health and development and media action nepal it is also being streamed live on the facebook page of cns we have with us today a very eminent panel of speakers comprising experts from the world health organization indian council of medical research and aids society of india who will help us understand the key issues and core challenges to control the spread of antimicrobial resistance or amr that is posing serious health challenges to human animal and plant life and it is just not about resistance to antibiotics but much more than that just a few quick housekeeping announcements before we begin participants please mute yourself while the speakers present there will be a question and answer session right after the presentation of each speaker please type in your questions and your comments in the chat box or raise your virtual hand if you wish to ask your question as far as possible please indicate the name of your media outlet unless you are a free freelancer in the interest of time please try to keep your question short and brief we have already received a few questions in advance and they will be taken up during the course of the session also one last request we are living in difficult times and many of us are still working from home so please pardon and bear with any technical glitches beyond our control that might arise due to poor internet connectivity thank you for your understanding and patience without any further ado i would like to welcome our first speaker for today he is none other than dr helisus getahun director of the department of global coordination and partnership on antimicrobial resistance at the world health organization he is also the director of joint tripartite comprising food and agriculture organization of the united nations world organization for animal health and the who secretariat on amr that coordinates the joint work of the organizations across the one health spectrum earlier dr getahun was director of the secretariat of the un interagency coordination group on antimicrobial resistance that was established by the un secretary general and released a ground breaking report on how to respond to the global antimicrobial resistance over to you dr getahun thank you very much uh, shobha and uh, welcome everyone uh, good good evening good morning and wherever you are and i don't know whether i can share my slides um, yes yes you can use the share slide option uh, and you can share it You have the share slide option, sir. On yes. Can you see my slides? Yes, 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 yes. We can. Okay. Good. So thank you very much. I think what I'm going. To, can you see now the slide? Yes, or, yes, yes. Okay, yes. good. So what I'm going to give you is a quick uh, update. Uh, first of all, uh, I think thank you very much for your interest, and this is a uh, preparation uh, for uh, your uh, reporting role. Uh, when we embark uh, into the world antimicrobial awareness week uh, as of this uh, uh, Thursday and this is a very unique and good opportunity to bring you know this complex issue into the limelight and uh, 
you are reporting wherever you are into your national uh, media I will be extremely helpful and I'm so happy uh, that uh, uh, this media forum is organized to make you prepare and my presentation will really trying to give you the broader uh, political context and drivers. And one thing uh, which I would like to start is antimicrobial resistance is actually a natural phenomenon. Uh, when the microbes, be it bacteria, virus, fungus, or parasites, they always try to thrive and change um, uh, over time so that they will not anymore uh, respond to the treatment. And this in turn can cause uh, spread of infection, spread of um, disease, as well as death. And we know ever since Alexander Fleming invented penicillin, you know, the first antibiotic, uh, we know that uh, resistance development has been an inherent uh, part of the uh, action of this uh, uh, drugs. And just to make sure that we are all clear, antimicrobials, you know, it's a range of drugs that can uh, affect uh, uh, bacteria, viruses, fungus, and also parasites like malaria. Why is the antimicrobial resistance complex? This is because we share, humans share antimicrobials, antibiotics with humans animals and plants. And of course, there are certain drugs that can only be used in animals, uh, but most drugs are used commonly across humans, animals, and even plants. Plants are also sprayed with antibiotics, antifungal, and sometimes also antiviral. So the drivers of antimicrobial resistance as it is stipulated here is actually where we see that infections are happening. So preventing infection with good water and sanitation and hygiene, be it in the clinical setting or be it in the veterinary setting or in the food producing you know, setting will be extremely important. This will help really to stop uh, the spread of infection and in turn also reduce the use of antimicrobials, you know, to treat those infections. And in addition to that, there is quite a lot of uh, misuse, uh, which means unnecessary use uh, over and also overuse uh, all in humans, in animals, and also in food uh, production. And this uh, also is a critical uh, important uh, issue that we have to address through different mechanisms, including the regulation, and also by re enhancing the robustness of the system, be it the human health system or the veterinary health system in order to make sure that these antibiotics, these antimicrobials are prescribed based on the needs and based also on the oversight of a trained professional. So I think this is critically important. And we also have you know, discharges coming from manufacturing of these antimicrobials, these antibiotics that goes into the environment. And although the evidence is still building, are also a concern that it may lead into drug resistance. The human health impact, when we look at it, one thing which I would like to tell you is that there is no global figure at this point in time that actually captures the overall burden of uh, drug resistance in, in, in humans. We have the famous 700,000 annual deaths, which was reported first by the O'Neill report in 2015. But that report is only focusing on uh, six pathogens, including malaria and HIV, which as you know, which are not bacteria. The, uh, we, but we also know there are at least 23 bacteria infections that cause illness and drug resistance in humans that needs to be accounted into this. 
So this 700,000 uh, figure is a very, very, very uh, substantially uh, underestimation because it only focuses on four bacteria, including uh, tuberculosis. So, but the good news is that uh, we are waiting a release of uh, robust global you know, data that actually uh, shows the exact burden of antibacterial resistance uh, among, you know, in, in the human, uh, which will be released anytime. That really helps to address uh, this major, major gap. The other human-animal interface, and as I said, the animals use antibiotics, antimicrobials, and there is increased, as you can see this uh, on this map, you know, the um, deep red shows the highest uh, percentage of resistance among animals. Uh, it's a global figure that was published, which really is significantly high. And you are, as you can see in chicken and in pig and in cattle, more than 50% of resistance of common antibiotics was, was reported. And this is a, a extremely uh, concerning uh, problem because there is also evidence that this drug resistance infections that are generated in the animals can also be transmitted to humans and can cause human illnesses as well as deaths. The other issue with antimicrobial resistance, which is still not a robust data, which we are working to improve, is its economic impact. Because antimicrobials are used to enhance food security, food safety, and also thread. So this brings a necessary uh, uh, attention of the economic interest to come into the administration and the management of the, be it the animal health or uh, the human health aspect of it. But we have figure from World Bank that it has substantial impact, uh, which is futuristic. But currently we are working how we can actually more, uh, develop this on annual, really showing what is the current impact on it. As I said, the, well, also in environmental due to the manufacturing, as well as also through discharge because animals and humans use antimicrobials and uh, after they consume them, they use them, they are also discharged into the environment, into the uh, you know, different settings. So that actually, uh, be it in the health sector or in the food processing, is also a challenge that needs to be addressed. Tourism is because it's a journey. You know, sometimes you can see some uh, sensational reporting around drug resistance. And the famous one was the one reported in you know, Pakistan some time ago about drug resistance, uh, you know, typhoid and dysentery, which really sometimes, and it is really uh, carries a risk. And COVID also another challenge that brings the attention of uh, AMR. And uh, unfortunately, although WHO doesn't recommend the use of uh, antibiotics, especially for the mild and you know, moderate uh, without uh, evidence of bacterial infection, there is huge, huge use of antibiotics, which we don't know the impact at this point in time, but will be really of a concern. And especially those in hospitals are being uh, given antibiotics without the need that they have to use it. So this is a, an extremely uh, important point that we have to look and also really to take the lessons out of the COVID, how we can address and how we can you know, take the lessons in, in order to address uh, AMR, which some people are actually call it a silent pandemic, while others are uh, countering this silent pandemic and saying, no, it's actually an active volcano that is ongoing, which I tend to agree. So I think this is just to give you a general uh, uh, outlook, and I'm happy to hear uh, any questions and I will respond. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for a very lucid overview of AMR and for touching on aspects which till now have been a little less understood. 
Uh, we now open for question and answers. Participants, please type in your questions in the chat box or raise your virtual hand if you wish to ask your question. We already have a few questions with us. There's a question from Muthoni Waveru, who's news anchor and health journalist at Capital FM, Kenya. Uh, she wants to know what are the latest milestones achieved in the development of antimicrobials for reducing communicable disease mortality and for advancing cancer therapy, et cetera. And how is antimicrobial resistance thwarting these attempts? So, as I said, uh, antimicrobial resistance is a natural phenomenon. That uh, the bacteria, the fungi, the virus, and the parasites, they always evolve and change over time to uh, enable them not to be attacked by the medicines. So, the concern here since it is the question refers to you know, cancer patients is because the cancer patients since because of their treatment or because of their illness, they have uh, less immunity, which actually also makes them susceptible for infections, you know, be it drug susceptible infection or drug resistant uh, infection. And as you know, cancer treatment uh, is also very expensive. Uh, compared to treating a bacterial infection. So sometimes these patients may die because of the bacterial drug resistant infection, uh, which could have been easy to treat. But the challenge we face here is that the pipeline for new antibiotics, uh, particularly uh, for the drug resistant infections, uh, is a challenging pipeline. And also, of course, there are attempts, but we have faced a complicated you know, challenge because the private uh, pharma industry has been one after the other being exiting from the research and development of the antibiotic you know, pipeline in the last decade, particularly. And this, uh, in a way, and this is the, the reason being uh, these antibiotics are not profitable. Um, and this begs the question, how should we address? And there are several discussions, several mechanisms, how to address this major gap that will also, in, in order to enable the uh, development of new antibiotics, not only the development, but also the access, the access to everyone that needs them is uh, something that has been taken at a higher you know, political uh, level uh, that um, uh, we have to take and we have to advocate. And I believe, and this is my personal opinion, antibiotics should be public good and should be available for everyone and should be also taken care of by, by government. And uh, once we have that, you know, good pipeline to address uh, drug resistant bacterial infections and also ensuring their access will be extremely useful to address the challenge we faced, for example, like in cancer patients. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We have a question from Ashok Ramsuru, a very senior journalist from who was who worked for several years with South Africa Broadcasting Corporation, SABC. And uh, Ashok wants to know that antimicrobial resistance poses major challenges around the world in the treatment of infectious diseases. We are in the 21st century. What hopes do you foresee to eradicate TB in the next generation? Okay. So uh, to eradicate TB, yes. um, I think the current global efforts around TB is not actually to eradicate it. I know there was uh, uh, an earlier uh, target set in the early 90s, which actually calls for eradicating TB uh, by 2050. But we know that uh, when the current uh, end, end TB strategy, you know, the intention is to end TB as a public health uh, uh, problem 
by 2030 as part of the sustainable development you know, goals. And that uh, over the last decade, we have seen quite uh, encouraging progress around uh, you know, achieving those goals and uh, treating more patients. Uh, but in the last year and a half or two years, the COVID pandemic has actually reversed it. And uh, for the first time, the uh, TB days have been reported uh, as increased because of this impact on COVID. And as you know, the TB uh, system globally has quite robust uh, data collection system, which is reliable uh, as it was really built over the last three decades. And uh, the fact that uh, we are able to see uh, because of the disruption of services, TB services by COVID, um, these figures have been high. So this is a big set, uh, setback that we have to look and we have to address, uh, which I think uh, will also affect just like any other health program, including, by the way, antimicrobial resistance, the impact of COVID in disrupting programs and also progress will be a key challenge. So I think we have to pause and we have to see uh, what we mean you know, in our you know, set ambitions, how we can take forward. Thank, Thank you. you. We have a question from Kalpana Acharya, who's editor in chief, Health TV Online from Nepal. Kalpana wants to know how has COVID-19 brought more challenges to AMR or has it affected AMR in some ways? Yeah, I just tried to mention that in my earlier response. Mm -hmm. I think from oh. programmatic aspects, there has been quite a lot of reports that uh, the disruption of services, the disruption of programs has uh, resulted in disruption of uh, routine uh, antimicrobial resistant uh, activities that are run by you know, countries. And this was recently published based on a survey that was conducted among those focal points working in countries on antimicrobial resistance. And when we looked into also the individual, you know, patient you know, perspective, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the, because of the COVID, uh, despite, you know, COVID is a, a viral disease. We don't need to use antibiotics in viral disease unless we have evidence of the uh, bacterial infection. And then uh, we have a report. Uh, actually, there is a, a COVID clinical platform where we also collect data on the use of antibiotics. And I think there are uh, like 38 countries reporting on the routine basis of the use of antibiotics in COVID patients. And it's, uh, it's really, really uh, high. It's between 80 to 90% of the COVID patients are used, are being given antibiotics, including those who are not uh, needing it. So this means that uh, I cannot quantify the impact now, but we have to really look all these uh, issues, what long-term, uh, medium-term, short-term impact they would have on the, our response to AMR. Thank you. We have two similar questions, so I'll take them up just one after the other uh, for your response. Oh, uh, they are from Mokatam Madhu Babu, a medical correspondent from Andhra Pradesh in India, and uh, a similar question from Ellis Tembe from Eswatini. Uh, both say that in many countries, including my country, like in India and Eswatini, antibiotics are sold over the over as as the over the counter drugs. Is it possible to strictly implement their sale as a prescription drug? because the abuse of antibiotics is leading to more resistance. And can WHO help in this regard? That is one of the correspondents asking me. Yes, I think misuse, overuse, and over-the-counter sale of antibiotics is a big challenge. It's uh, oversell, uh, over-the-counter sale is not only for humans, it's also for animals. So I think that is why we have to really look uh, how we are intending to address anti, uh, uh, AMR in general and the use of antibiotics, you know, be it in humans and animals in a very comprehensive way. So the regulation 
and the national regulation of uh, the over-the-counter use of antibiotics is critical. And we are recommending antibiotics should only be used uh, uh, with prescription from a trained, you know, be it in the animal, in the veterinary services, also in the human, you know, services. They shouldn't be really over the counter. But as you all know, and even there are countries who ban the over, over the counter of antibiotics, you know, for humans and animals. But the whole problem and the whole challenge is how to enforce, you know, this regulation, how to enforce uh, these uh, national uh, rules. So I think that really requires uh, concerted efforts across sectors. And uh, this is one area which we are uh, fully uh, uh, working towards uh, with our partners uh, in uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, in the Organization of Animal Health, as well as also in the, you know, in the UN environment, because we have to see the legal framework, the regulation in, in the broader context. Um, it's not only uh, about the over-the-counter, but it's also about import. It's also about the quality of the drugs, because if the uh, drugs are not of good quality, they also lead into the development of drug resistance. So I think we have to look at it in a broader context. And yes, that is a big challenge. And that is one thing which we have to seriously address. Thank you. Now, uh, one, there are other questions, but one last question from you. Uh, uh, this is from Mensidini from Papua New Guinea. And uh, Mensidini says that testing for drug resistance in P PNG has been a major problem. TB drug resistant samples went to Australia for testing. Dr. Getahun, please give your advice on how to combat AMR in the Pacific nations. Can you repeat the question? I didn't, I missed the first part. Okay. Uh, it, is, it says that the testing for drug resistance, uh, particularly in TB, for TB, is a major problem in Papua New Guinea. And TB drug samples went to Australia for testing. Can you advise on how to combat AMR in the Pacific nations? Yeah, so I think, I mean, this question is more focused on TB. And yes, yes. Um, yeah, TB diagnosis is actually much, much, much more advanced than other bacteria diagnosis because, of course, we started with microscope 100 years ago. And now we have a gene expert, which not only you know, diagnose uh, drug susceptible TB, but also drug resistant TB. And also further, we have several other diagnostic tools that could help for the specification uh, of um, uh, the, the resistance pattern. So capacity and uh, diagnostic capacity, local capacity is important and uh, especially the, the laboratory network uh, is also important that the quality that is being established at national level has to also have that quality check through the supranational laboratory systems and mechanisms. That will also help, but anything that is not focused also in enhancing local capacity, but really uh, exporting specimen uh, is not, uh, is not a good uh, mechanism. Uh, but when you come into bacteria, actually it's very difficult. Uh, diagnosis in bacterial infections. Uh, there are some uh, attempts, there are some uh, promising technologies coming up in the pipeline. But when you really compare it from a programmatic perspective, what is happening in TB and what is happening in uh, bacteria, is totally different. However, we have the, an opportunity, particularly to strengthen laboratories within the human health system. As you know, the Global Fund has supported you know, uh, health system approach where they also really help uh, the laboratory platform. It's not only for HIV, TB, malaria, but also for other you know, uh, diseases and, uh, and bacterial infections and in really ensuring bacterial uh, microbiology laboratories 
would be a, a good uh, way forward that we have to look how to strengthen. And the good news, uh, the Global Fund, I think last week, they have adopted their new strategy uh, from 2023, 2026, I think. And in that, AMR has been framed as part of the pandemic preparedness or uh, pandemic response um, way has been identified as one key area. So we need to really advocate, we need to really look the opportunities, how we can advance this microbiology bacterial laboratory using the already existing system. Because Global Fund currently spent 1 billion a year for those cross-cutting health systems. So really having a bacterial diagnosis, you know, like a liquid culture within that platform that is already established may only need a small additional cost. So we need to look into those existing upcoming opportunities, which we are all excited, by the way, uh, of this opportunity to work with the Global Fund for HIV TB Malaria to address this neglected AMR. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And before we move on to our next speaker, I would like to invite Mr. Thomas Joseph, head of the Antimicrobial Resistance Stewardship and Awareness at WHO, for his comments. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Shobha. And uh, thanks very much, Dr. Getahun, for that excellent comprehensive presentation. Um, I think I just noticed that a few people came in late. And because they came in late, maybe it's in, important to just underline a few core messages that you know we need to communicate quite simply to a vast audience. And the audience that we hope we will reach besides the general public includes you know, all those who are prescribing medicines. So you know, whether they are chemists or whether they are physicians, but also uh, the policymakers so that they also can understand the importance of this issue. And I think the core messages that you know, those who came in late may want to engage with is that antimicrobial resistance is undermining a century of progress in medicine, that infections that were previously treatable and curable with our drugs are becoming incurable medicines are not working because of resistance. So even common infections are becoming risky and a problem. Surgeries are becoming risky. And the cause for all this can be found primarily in the behavior of human beings who are misusing, overusing antimicrobials. We talked about over-the-counter sales of antimicrobials. This should become unacceptable. We must ensure as a core message that when we are sick, that Really, we only take antimicrobials with medical advice and medical supervision. So thank you again. Uh, uh, my thanks again to Dr. Haile Yusuf for his presentation and to you, Shobha, for organizing this. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Elizabeth Taylor. Dr. Taylor is the technical lead for WHO in the Tripartite Joint Secretariat for AMR, supporting the collaboration between FAO, OIE, UNEP, and WHO at global, regional, and country levels. She has led the development of the tripartite strategy and development of the AMR multi-partner trust fund. Welcome, Dr. Taylor. We are keen to hear from you about the importance of the tripartite partnership and the One Health approach. Over to you. Good morning and good afternoon, participants. Um, and it's great to talk to you. Uh, I'm going to share some slides, which I hope will complement the messages that uh, Haile shared. Uh, I will try and go quickly so that there is more time for discussion. Um, but let me start anyway, straight away. Um, so I think the host has disabled participant screen sharing. I get a message. So perhaps I, if I can be allowed to share my screen, that would be great. Yes, um, you can use that screen share button, which you must be seeing, and then you'll be able to share it. Uh, I get yes. host, when I post share screen, I get host disabled participant screen sharing. Um, so I maybe change that, or I could send this presentation to Thomas, and Thomas could perhaps share it for me. Would that be possible? Sure, 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 Liz. If you can send it to me. Dr. Paulin, can you try one more time, please? Yeah. 
Try one more time, doctor. Please okay. try one more time. Try one oh, more time. Marvelous. You've done whatever you've done. You've worked some magic uh, and it seems to be working. So that is great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and can we share my... Can you see my screen yet? No. What are we doing now? Yes, 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 we can. Okay. Yes. So what I'm going to do, uh, it's a sort of global overview, focusing particularly on the One Health aspects that highly built, and then talking a little bit about how, at a global and a country level, we work together with the Food and Agriculture Organization, the Organization for Animal Health, and increasingly with the um, United Nations Environment Programme. So this is a slight, similar slide to the one Haile actually showed, but it's worth reiterating that AMR is a complex problem. As Thomas said, humans are abusing antibiotics, but we've been abusing them not only in the human health sector, but in fish farming, in animal farming, uh, in producing livestock. Uh, and treating in animals who are sick. We have inadequate water and sanitation, there's discharge of antimicrobials into water, and increasingly antibiotics have even been used and sprayed on crops. And all of this, the more we use antibiotics in any sector, the greater the chance that resistance will develop and that these drugs will become uh, ineffective. So, in the human sector, one of the issues is that antibiotics are used as a substitute for having decent infrastructure, for decent hygiene measures, and for proper diagnosis and treatment. Um, over 30% of health facilities don't have running water or a clean toilet. So it's very difficult to practice good hygiene in those environments. So antibiotics are used as a cheaper substitute. This is an issue in the developing world, but it is also as much an issue in developed countries where there is still very widespread um, use of antibiotics in the prevention of, of, of infection and in treating infections that don't respond. Things like flu, where antibiotics don't work, but they're still being used. We were talking about over-the-counter sales, and this again is a big risk when this, this poor person is, is, is buying antibiotics from a market stall and neither he nor the vendor are aware of how these drugs should be used and they may well be of a lower quality. This is a problem in the human sector, but it's as much a problem in the animal sector where there is a big push to intensify agriculture, intensify livestock production, very often in unsanitary facilities, with poor biosecurity, and so a lot of antibiotics are used uh, to prevent infections. Or if there's a small risk of an infection in a herd, the whole herd will be treated. Antibiotics in many countries are still also being used to promote growth in animals. So in many countries, more antibiotics is being fed to healthy animals than to sick humans or sick animals. But it's not just humans and animals. One of the things we're becoming increasingly aware of is that antibiotics are actually being used uh, in the production of food, uh, sprayed large amounts, sprayed on orange trees in California. Streptomycin, a drug very important for TB and tetracycline, sprayed on crop production, used in rice production. Antifungals have been used to treat flowers, and that's been linked to the development of resistance in humans. So across the board, we have a problem with antibiotics being used in, in, in food and, and, and health, human health. And one of the problems is that this then leaches into the environment, into the rivers. We have antibiotics residues as a waste product of food production, washing off fields, washing off from animal production and from hospitals, and all ending up in the water supply where people are bathing, where they are getting their drinking water. Very often there are high levels of, of bacteria in these 
waters as well if there's inadequate sanitation. So that's a pretty toxic soup in which resistance bacteria will develop, thrive, and be transmitted. And a lot of the time we're talking about this as though it's a problem of Europe and developed countries. And in those countries, there are sufficient infrastructure and sufficient labs to actually detect this and get a good idea of the scale of the problem. But increasingly, we are realizing that the biggest burden of infection is in Africa, in Asia, in lower middle income countries. And almost certainly the biggest burden of resistance is occurring in those countries. And these are the countries whose health systems are least resilient, least able to deal with untreatable infections or infections that will become much more expensive and difficult to treat. So this is a real crisis globally, but particularly for low and middle income countries. So politically, there was a global action plan developed in 2015 by WHO. And at that stage, the Food and Agriculture Organization and the Organization for Animal Health, the OIE, also endorsed that plan. And in 2016, it was taken to the UN General Assembly, uh, where heads of state said, we need to work together. We need a one health approach. We need to take this forward. And since then, there has been intensified uh, collaboration across sectors to work out what we do and how we take things forward. Um, there was an interagency coordination group that provided a report. And even through the pandemic, one of the first hybrid meetings in the UN happened in April this year with a high level dialogue on AML, signed up by 110 countries that we must continue to take action. And we as WHO work very closely with the Food and Agriculture Organization, who looks after food production, the food sector, the Organization of Animal Health that works with the veterinary sector, and increasingly with the United Nations Environment Programme to coordinate action uh, and also support global governance structures. Each sector needs to be strong. So FAO will work with the agricultural ministries, provide technical support to the food sector. Uh, and, and similarly, OIE with the vets. So we need strong sectors that coming together with a one health approach to coordinate uh, and get a better overview of the system. We now have a fantastic uh, global leaders group, uh, which is chaired by Prime Minister of Barbados, Nir Motti, and the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, and has leaders from across sectors and across regions. You can see the very diverse ge geographic spread and the heads of the four agencies to really keep the political flame alive, to drive this politically uh, and to push the agenda forward. We're in the process of developing a, a multi-stakeholder partnership platform, which will allow civil society, academia, the private sector to come together to debate, to drive the agenda forward. Um, we were, one of the big things in development is of this course, the sustainable development goals. And there are now two indicators uh, around the, the SDG indicator framework. They're both in the human health space, but we can only achieve those by working across the SDGs in water and sanitation, sustainable production, partnerships, poverty, economic growth. But of course, the key thing really is to have action at country level. Global catalysis, providing the norms and standards and everything is really important. But at country level, each country committed to develop their own national action plan. They need to be multi-sectoral. They need to look across those sectors and strengthen all the sectors. And it is very encouraging that countries are developing their plans. They're starting to implement them but there's still a major challenge that they're not yet in many places implemented at scale and resourcing and getting these things into plans and budgets is a major change. It's really important that we mirror this collaboration between sectors at country level. So all countries are encouraged to develop their own multi-sectoral coordination groups. And there is progress on that and substantial progress over the last five years, but we've still got a long way to go. And in many countries, those exist on paper, but are not really going forward. 
uh, in practice and, and really functional and active. And that's another key area. So how do we ensure that these precious drugs are being used more, more, more effectively? Well, regulation is really important. And Thomas and Hailey have both talked about the importance of stopping over-the-counter sales. And in many countries, most countries, 91% of the countries in the world, there is regulation about this. The challenge then is implementation. Um, there is, uh, most countries regulate sales of antimicrobials for animal use. Over almost two thirds have banned their use for growth promotion. Um, but so we're getting there, but then the challenge will be taking this into practice. So I said I'd be as quick as possible. And so to sum up, um, we need to do more. We're building the systems across the sectors to address AMR. We're starting to get good coordination mechanisms, but we're not going to scale fast enough. Um, we've got some political interest, we need more, and you are critical advocates in getting that message across, helping us to shift this from something that scientists talk about in drugs and bugs with long names into a message that is meaningful for everybody and, and really makes people think and act. And then we need to get more money uh, into these plans so that they can really go to scale. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Taylor. And thank you for really emphasizing on that one health concept that either we live together or we perish together. <laughs> so I, that, that I think we need to keep in mind. Uh, and participants, please send your questions for Dr. Taylor. We already have a few questions uh, for you. Uh, Rita Vidyadana, a very senior journalist from Jakarta, Indonesia. She wants to know how the current climate change issues are affecting AMR and health conditions of human, animals, and plants, given the challenging extreme environmental conditions, which certainly worsens infectious diseases. Yes, thank you very much. And this is a really good question. And if you want a detailed brief on this, the global leaders are actually publishing a brief on this. Um, but you're absolutely right. Climate change is causing changes in disease patterns. Um, and it's across the board. We see it a lot with malaria, but with other diseases as well. Uh, and we have adverse events that cause things like cholera, typhoid, other things. And that increase in bugs will make and will be more resistance and so people, many more vulnerable populations are going to be exposed to those and it will make things significantly worse and also the disruption that we get from those weather events and everything else and the people movements that will be happening will all put extra pressure on the system uh, and resistance will compound that Okay, thank you. Uh, just adding on to that, you talk of the adverse effects which are uh, increasing uh, antimicrobial resistance. There's a question from Dr. Tin Mong uh, Thuy, editor of Health Digester from Myanmar. And he says, what countries like Myanmar, which are in difficult situ political situations and other con similar countries, how do they deal with this growing menace of AMR? because there the problems become a little different. They do, and it, but it is just as important. And we need to really focus on the basics. So in Myanmar, in fragile states, in low resource states, let's focus on getting immunization levels up, getting, focusing on water supply or hand hygiene and the basics, because that's important for public health anyway. Right. In the animal sector, again, try and ensure basic uh, infection prevention. Uh, and then for the antibiotics we have, we should focus on getting good access to the first line antibiotics, we call them access. Those are the categories that you will need in Myanmar for children with pneumonia. Make sure they have amoxicillin, the basics. But we don't want them, those countries to be spreading and using widely the watch and reserve, those that we want to keep in second line. So it's keeping it simple, focusing on the basics, focusing on first line treatment of infection. Um, but, but it is a challenge, particularly in fragile and complex states, and just knowing what's going on. Thank you. Uh, Wali Heather from Pakistan wants to know that here in Pakistan, faith-based healers and other med medical disciplines use medicines 
which are not much regulated. Also, contents of the medicine are not known so publicly, traditional wisdom, knowledge, etc. Is it contributing to AMR also? I think this is a difficult one, and I think certainly there is a risk when antibiotics, and we don't know what antibiotics or what quality, are just added into a mixture. And that certainly is a bad thing. But faith-based medicine and people treating people with non-pharmacological treatment may be a very good thing. People with flu and who other non-bacterial infections, actually having somebody who provides treatment, provides care, supports them, uh, if they're not using antibiotics, uh, that's a great thing. It would be perhaps you know, for flus, for colds and everything else, that's a, a, a great treatment. Um, but please don't add in a little bit of this and antibiotics and cook. And you, you know, putting antibiotics into your mixture is very, very unhealthy. Okay. Uh, a question from Asela Amarasiri, uh, correspondent from Sri Lanka. Are globe trotters increasing the spread of AMR? Yes, probably. <laughs> uh, and certainly there was a fascinating study whereby the prevalence of antibiotic of resistance in different countries was tracked by looking at airline toilets. And all the planes coming into Schiphol, you could see where they'd come from by the um, bacteria in the feces in the toilets. So there is a spread. And I mean, this is why it's a global threat, global threat because resistance spreads very quickly. Um, whether it is through globetrotters and travel and tourists, whether it's the spread of food and livestock, um, we need to be very aware that when a bug develops, a resistant strain develops in one country, it spreads around the world within two or three years. Okay. Uh, one last question for you, Dr. Taylor. This is from Catherine from Zimbabwe. Uh, a similar question perhaps had been asked earlier. In Zimbabwe, antibiotics are a prescription drug. However, misuse still finds its way. We are not well resourced to afford running tests to see drugs work for patients at public institutions. I collect my ART from a funded center where treatment and service is comprehensive. Tests are run. I now know that I'm resistant to amoxicillin, penicillin, cotrimoxazole. I have never misused antibiotics. So can resistant build even when there's not, one does not misuse antibiotics? Yes, because actually, we just need a bit of a correction and a misapprehension here. You are not resistant to amoxicillin and tetracycline yeah. and penicillin. The bugs, the bacteria that you have for that particular infection are. So... And, and this is something that is, is, is important to be aware, that it is the bacteria that become resistant and then spread. So it is very possible for people who have never taken uh, antibiotics or certainly never abused antibiotics to develop, to, to catch strains that are resistant. Okay. Um, in terms of, of, of diagnosis and, and doing sensitivity testing, this is an issue. And in primary and most hospitals around the world, uh, we will not do sensitivity testing routinely because it is much more expensive. So that's why we have guidelines of these are the drugs that should work in this instance uh, and you should be adhering to those guidelines. Um, and, and that's how we take it forward. Okay. Thank and that's why we do surveillance to try and work yeah. out what the resistance yeah. patterns yeah. are. Yeah, right. right. Thank you very much. And uh, now I invite uh, Mr. Thomas once again for his comments and uh, there is a question for you also so first your comment please um, uh, thank you very much shoba i'm very happy to give comments i'm not very sure if i'm able to answer <laughs> questions <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but but but, yeah. but just to say first of all a very warm thanks to liz who you know came on very short notice and for her tremendous expertise and understanding and knowledge which she has shared i think that's really useful and somebody asked, you know, a question in the chat about what would you want the media to do? Exactly. I, uh, can I interrupt? I was going to ask you that question only. <laughs> ah, okay. So then I'm happy to answer that yes, question. Yeah, that was the question. Because, because actually media can do a lot. And it is actually quite critical that media does a lot. Uh, 
Antimicrobial resistance is poorly understood, very poorly understood. And I think Liz has now brought out the issues that uh, really must sink in, that these are integrative across one health. So whether you're dealing with animal health, plant health, the environment, or human health, antimicrobial resistance is a key issue. And the drivers can be found in misuse and overuse and other factors, all of which are driven by, or most of which are driven by human beings themselves. And so the agency is that of our agency, us as humans, and we have a responsibility to change things. Take the issue of growth promotion, antibiotic use to increase the weight of animals and to you know, make them better sales at markets. Is this okay? No, it's not. We've got to stop it. How do we stop it? We've got to get consumers to be able to distinguish between meat that is antibiotic free and meat that is that has used antibiotics for growth, growth promotion and with their cash say no you won't buy this and this will happen and is happening but it can be fueled by the media highlighting the issue taking it to the public and say it's your choice what sort of meat do you want to eat antibiotic free or with antibiotics so there are a host of issues, you know, antibiotics being used for prophylaxis, you know, to prevent disease before they even start. You know, is this okay? It's not done by the animals, it's done by the humans, right? So the media has a tremendous role to really bring these core messages. I think the last one was very important that we are not the ones as humans who are resistant. It is the bacteria within us and these can travel across borders easily. It's not just globe trotters. Anyone who travels can carry a resistant bacteria, and then that can spread within the population. So it's serious. How can we stop it? Can we educate the public in a way that is simple, effective? And you know, we stand ready to give you fact sheets, data, links, and so on, but ultimately to convert it into the language that can be easily understood by the public is your task. And I really invite you to do that during this week in particular. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now invite Dr. Leanne Gonzalez to tell us about the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week that begins from Thursday, November 18, and also about the Glo Go Blue campaign. Dr. Gonzalez is the Technical Officer for AMR Awareness and Campaigns in WHO's Antimicrobial Resistance Division. She coordinates WHO's involvement in World Micro Antimicrobial Awareness Week. In addition, working on the division's broader AMR-related awareness and behavior changes, change portfolios. Over to you, Dr. Gonzalez. You are... You are muted. Please unmute yourself. We cannot hear you. Apologies. Is that better? Yeah. Yes. 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 Perfect. Thank you, Shova. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Brilliant. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you so much for joining. Um, and thank you to Shova and Thomas for beautifully setting up this presentation. Um, we are grateful to CNS for putting together this briefing because this is extremely timely. World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, as Shoba mentioned, begins this Thursday and runs from the 18th through the 24th of November. And so what I'm going to do in my presentation is give you a bit of background as to why we globally come together to celebrate this week um, and hopefully how it can inform the reporting that you do as well. A little bit of background on uh, World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, or WOW, as we call it. Um, it is something that has been celebrated, is celebrated jointly across the tripartite organizations that Dr. Taylor mentioned in her presentation. That's the Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Organization for Animal Health, and WHO, as well as in more recent years, the UN Environmental Program. So similar to antimicrobial resistance being a One Health issue that needs to get addressed in different sectors, during this week of international awareness, all of these sectors work together to raise awareness of antimicrobial resistance in their, um, in their universe. It is a relatively young health campaign. I know we have many people here who have worked for, for decades in tuberculosis. So as compared with the decades worth of advocacy and awareness in some of in diseases like tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV, 
WOW has only been marked since 2015. Um, and it came about with the passing of the Global Action Plan for Antimicrobial anti, uh, Resistance, the GAP. Um, and the GAP had was the first sort of international plan um, that was passed at the World Health Assembly that brought countries around the table together to come up with a harmonized plan of action for addressing AMR. And one of the first things that for one of the first objectives that was there in the gap was to improve awareness and understanding through communication, education and training. And I think the two presenters before me have, have really emphasized and it's come out in the discussion, the fact that this is a complex issue and one around which we need to have general awareness. So um, WOW offers a chance for a week to bring global awareness to this global health threat. Um, and that we see as a, an integral and, and critical first step to behavior change. People can't change their behavior if they don't understand what the issue is. Some things that have happened in WOW since it was developed um, are that last year we expanded from focusing on antibiotics. Previously, WOW was World Antibiotic Awareness Week. And from 2020 onwards, we broadened to encompass all antimicrobials. So that includes antibiotics, but also antivirals, antifungals, and antiparasitics. And so that means that we're able to discuss and, and talk about together resistance as it emerges in different types of diseases. So, you know, we talked about tuberculosis, which is bacteria based, but also drug resistant malaria, which is parasite based, drug resistant HIV, which is a virus, etc. And the other thing that came up is in 2020, we fixed the dates of observance from the 18th to the 24th of November. So this year, the theme for WOW is spread awareness, stop resistance. The idea being that if we all understand and we make efforts to spread antimicrobial resistance awareness where we can, that that is that integral first stop to stopping the rise of drug resistance itself. With this theme, the hope of the tripartite agencies is that everyone across all of the One Health sectors can become an AMR awareness champion. So the goal is to encourage everyone to be a champion in their sphere of influence. If you are a medical student and you're hoping to reach out to members of your medical school, that is brilliant. If you are um, a farmer and have the opportunity to reach out within your community, that's important. If you're a member of the AMR Global Leaders Group and you are a parliamentarian or the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, you can act in your um, much larger sphere of influence as well. Another thing that we want to do with spread awareness and stop resistance is we want to humanize antimicrobial resistance. I think we all recognize it, even in some of the questions we've seen, that it's very easy to fixate on the drugs and the bugs, to focus on the specific drug names, which are really long, you know, just talk about issues of access, all of which are critical. But at the same time, if we're thinking about how we make people care about an issue, one of the things is to humanize the issue, to show people that this is not just about the microbes and the microscopic, but it's about people today who are affected. It's about individuals who have experienced an infection. It's about doctors and nurses whose um, methods of treatment and, and um, prescribing protocols now have to shift because of the resistance that they're seeing. It's about um, you know, farmers and agriculture workers who are seeing shifts in how they raise their animals and in their economic livelihoods. So we want to humanize AMR as an issue, not of tomorrow, but one affecting individuals and communities today. Um, when, when we talk about, because I know so much of what we do right now both exists in, it exists in the virtual world and on social media, ways that you can tap into everything that is happening, the very latest going on in the AMR world during WOW are on those hashtags, WOW, antimicrobial resistance, handle with care, and AMR. And that's how you can join the global conversation on social media. If you're looking for more background on just the how we're describing the campaign and the agreed upon phrasing from the tripartite organizations for WOW, there's campaign guidance, which I can post in the chat afterwards, that gives some uniform language on the theme, um, key information on social media, important dates to mark within the week. And it also provides an idea of some of the um, 
event activities you might see in your respective communities and national markets. So there, the, the guidance provided global level event ideas with the idea being that these could be locally adapted uh, depending on the needs and the interests of um, communities, um, different professional communities, different geographic communities. Some other resources that are available, that um, QR code, and I'll post links as well uh, during the Q&A session, um, takes you to WHO's campaign landing page. But there are a variety of social media stills that are openly available for download and use. Um, uh, some photo stories. We are also trying to walk the talk when we talk about how to humanize AMR as an issue. And so we are trying to um, bring together human stories from around the world. Um, and then, of course, a variety of website resources as well. And then Shoba had mentioned specifically um, the wanting to talk about a, a new initiative that the tripartite is launching, a very visual initiative. And so we are asking people this, this week, for this year for the first time, to go blue for AMR. And the reason that we're doing that is because we were looking for ways to bring needed global visibility to this health issue that, as you've heard in previous presentations, covers so many sectors, covers so many diseases, and yet is not often, is not understood or talked about enough. We wanted to elevate that conversation and the visibility of this issue. And so we're initiating a color campaign to do so. And the idea of this color campaign is that by encouraging all the different sectors and parts of our community that can affect antimicrobial resistance or are affected by antimicrobial resistance, by encouraging them to light up or color themselves blue during the week, we can get a snapshot of the extent to which AMR as a health threat affects and is affected by our action or inaction and the action or inaction of stakeholders in all of these sectors. And so what we're asking people to do is to engage with the color campaign in one or more of um, like three different levels. So first, people can go blue as an individual, and I am a walking example of that today. Um, during the campaign, people are encouraged to wear blue, um, to adjust their social media profiles um, to blue using some resources that we've produced that are available on our website. Um, and to describe and use that opportunity to share their personal commitment, to share their story, to share why this is an issue that they feel passionately about, why they see the need um, to bring awareness to this issue. Um, at the other end of the spectrum and something that is probably most visible is I'll uh, number three, what we have there going blue is a community. So we are, of course, encouraging landmarks to light up blue. And um, Thomas may have some, some of our latest news on where we might expect to see that taking place. But we're encouraging people to light up, you know, their national landmarks, but also um, different um, One Health uh, infrastructure. So a great example is lighting up water towers or sanitation facilities, just to again demonstrate how AMR, that AMR affects these issues. And the one that I think is personally the most interesting is we're asking workplaces to go blue. So we're asking anyone who, again, is affected by or can affect antimicrobial resistance, whether you're a pharmaceutical company, whether you are a hospital for, uh, or a health facility, whether you're a veterinary hospital, um, whether you are a pharmacy for humans or animals or both, to consider lighting up blue and again, demonstrating, again, the extent to which um, antimicrobial resistance affects us all. And when organizations, when individuals light up blue, it's also an opportunity. We want them to share that both with so on social media, but also through traditional media outlets as well, use as, a, as an opportunity to highlight either corporate commitments or organizational commitments or national commitments to antimicrobial resistance and action in that area. So that leaves me can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. 
Yeah. Okay. This QR code, I will um, can, uh, include a link to this in um, in the chat afterwards. Cub is takes you to our events page at WHO. There are a number of launches that are coming out, which might be of interest. There are new HIV drug resistant numbers getting launched on the 24th of November, for example. We want you to cover um, both international uh, AMR related events going on during WOW and also those happening nationally because it is really encouraging to see just how much um, we are seeing national governments get involved and take this opportunity to highlight um, their work in AMR, how much we're seeing professional associations around the world get involved, student groups around the world get involved. Um, and we want to um, encourage coverage of that. We also want to um, encourage people to find and cover the local stories and the human interest story to again, make sure that we are put, putting a human face to this issue. And finally, and this was mentioned by Thomas and um, Dr. Taylor in her previous con uh, presentation, you know, words matter and the words that you are using to describe this issue, which is a complex issue, matter and make critical contributions to broadly educating the general public, but also prescribers, prescribers and providers. And so um, we hope that you make use of the existing resources, the WHO fact sheets that we have uh, to make sure that we're reporting accurately. I'll stop there. Thank you again, Shoba. Um, and thank you for the opportunity, everyone. Thank you very much. And Leanne, I, I also tried to wear a shade of blue today, uh, different from yours. <laughs> and uh, thanks for bringing up this issue of humanizing uh, AMR, the problem of AMR. I think that is very uh, important to demedicalize it when we are uh, talking to people. And um, it is not just about medicines and microbes, but about actually human beings. That's important, as you brought out. Uh, we have had many questions, even advanced questions, uh, and um, basically from some African countries and Asian countries. Uh, one of them pertains to what are the key messages for the common public, even beyond WAP, which uh, uh, media and others and we as individuals can uh, concentrate upon. And is there any significance, particular significance of the color blue? Why? Yeah. Those are those are great questions. I mean, I think Thomas actually mentioned them. He summarized them beautifully. But I, I would say one is whoever you are, we all have a role to play um, in in preventing the rise of antimicrobial resistance. And if we want to know if we're talking really general public um, rather than, you know, I would say farmers have their own messages. Pharmacists have their own messages. But general public, it's when you need antimicrobials, that's antibiotics, antivirals, antifungals, or antiparasitics, these are medicines that we all need to collectively work to preserve. And so the way that we can do that as individuals is to take them only when prescribed and to take them as prescribed. That's, you know, that is probably the base message um, that when it comes to antimicrobials specifically. I think uh, Liz mentioned in her presentation as well that there are broader health promotion things that also play critical roles in preventing um, antimicrobial resistance. And that is making sure that you know our vaccinations are up to date, making sure that we take um, we are, you know, advocates of good um, hand washing, personal hygiene practices as well. And these are things that we're seeing um, a lot of, of, thankfully, a lot of global promotion on because of COVID, obviously. But for antimicrobials specifically, take them only when you need it as prescribed by a healthcare provider and take them as prescribed. Um, and then with... Um, with relation to the color blue, that's actually, it's a really good question and it's one that we, we get quite a lot. Um, so the, the answer is that we were trying to, we were searching for a color that we could link to AMR awareness. And what we thought of, because you've heard One Health used quite a lot, like health across sectors and light blue is this color that is associated with health broadly, I think possibly because of WHO a little bit. And so that felt like a very natural fit when we want to talk about health across all sectors. At the same time, light blue is, is a color that I think we associate possibly because of the UN with collaboration, international and multi-sectoral collaboration. So that made it a very natural fit for antimicrobial awareness 
a one health issue that requires international collaboration. Um, and that's what we've seen. And then the other, a very pragmatic thing is, you know, we, this is a young, this is a young health campaign. Um, and one of the enduring symbols of this young campaign is the symbol that you can see over my shoulder here, which is the antimicrobials handle with care stamp, that blue symbol. And so the opportunity to pick a color that seemed like a natural fit for antimicrobials and to also build upon the existing identity of this young campaign um, felt like a, a very natural choice. Thank you very much. And uh, now we are waiting for comments from Thomas. Well, thank you very much again, Shobha. And first of all, thanks a lot to Lian, who uh, you know did a really good job with that presentation, excellent uh, presentation and uh, responses as well. I actually would like to say two things that I think might help. The first is, you know, Lian has uh, put in uh, the the chat box, the links to the WOW, the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week campaign page. And in that, you will find materials that are free to use, high quality visuals, high quality graphics, uh, videos, and so on. Please use them as freely as you wish. The, the stamp that she talked about, Handle Antimicrobials with Care, it's there for you, for you to use as you wish in different languages, and please use it. But also my second point is besides using the materials that are available and the messages that you'll find in the website, I really want you to talk about going blue. The reason for this is that we hope that many monuments across the world will light up in blue. Our own headquarters, the building that you see behind me, that top part, that whole terrace is going to go blue for the week. But when it goes blue, it will be meaningless unless the media has told people why it's going blue. So if you could communicate you know, in advance of the week and during the week that the blue color is the AMR color, and this is when we remember that we must preserve our antimicrobials, we must not misuse them, we must not overuse them, then that color will have some meaning. Thank you, Shobha, and thank you, Leah. Uh, thank you, uh, Thomas. Just uh, there is a comment for you from Rita Vidyadana from Indonesia. And she says, I agree with Mr. Thomas Joseph that media can play a great role in raising people's awareness on AMR and its critical impacts on people's health, as well as on animals and plants. Yet media people have to be equipped with deep knowledge on this issue, which I think this global forum is able to impart them before covering and reporting and humanizing it. And uh, she wants to ask from Leanne, have you already engaged media in your global and national campaigns? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, just as for what's coming up for WOW, I know that there are weekly media advisories that WHO puts out um, just to brief journalists around the world um, who are subscribed to receive those media advisories. And so the one that is going out, I think this week will have some alert about WOW and and the fact that this is coming up and linked to, to the corresponding pages, a lot of which um, either I've posted or Bobby very helpfully has done. Thank you, Bobby. Um, and the I know that I believe the hope is that, you know, WHO has been doing these weekly press briefings um, starting from COVID and, and now they are continuing. I believe that there will likely be um, mention of this in, in the press briefing on the tail end of WOW, so on uh, maybe the week of the 24th itself. I do know that when it comes to briefing, um, journalists in around the world, our regional and country offices take a um, take the lead on that. And so what I know from our comms colleagues here is that all of our regional and country offices have been briefed on, on World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. And so um, we, we hope to see, we, we're very fortunate to have some really excellent um, regional campaigns that go on during WOW. Um, and so I think in a lot of a lot of the regions where people in this call are coming from, you'll have some regionally specific and regionally relevant information coming out for journalists as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, now we go on to our next speaker who is Dr. Sara Paulin, uh, technical officer in the AMR division of WHO. Uh, Dr. Pauline focuses on supporting countries in developing and sustainably implementing national action plans on AMR. 
which which are so very important i think so over to you dr pauling thank you very much and, and thank you also for having me it's a pleasure to be here and i, I think this is a fantastic initiative that is being taken can I just confirm that you can see my slides in presentation mode? Yes, not in presentation mode. We, we can uh, see your screen. Your screen okay. is okay. Yes, now you now see. you see them. Fantastic. Okay, wonderful. Um, my name is Sarah Pollen, and I work in the National Action Plan and Monitoring and Evaluation Unit here in WHO headquarters. And I'm going to try and provide you with a bit of information on national action plans to combat antimicrobial resistance and the progress over the last five years. As many of you probably know, national action plans um, for AMR, they lay the foundation for comprehensive support and action at country level against AMR. So let's see if I can move my slide. And apologies if some of this is repetitive, but I often think that some of the key messages, we need to repeat them more than once, as that's how we raise awareness and also hopefully eventually drive behavior change. So as we know, antimicrobial resistance is a, it's actually a natural phenomenon that occurs naturally. However, there are drivers, as we've already heard from previous speakers, across the different sectors that accelerate the emergence and spread of antimicrobial resistance. And the two main drivers are the misuse and abuse of antimicrobials in the human health sector and in the animal health sector, as has already been alluded to. And then as Leanne mentioned, really the key message is that we need to preserve our antimicrobials to take them only when and as prescribed and also to finish the course that we have been given. And so given that there are so many different drivers in antimicrobial resistance, as also was presented by Dr. Haile and also Dr. Liz, is that the action at country level has to be multi-sectoral and it has to be coordinated across the different sectors and within the various departments. As Leanne mentioned in her presentation, in 2015, the Global Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance was endorsed by all member states that laid the foundation and was also the blueprint for action at country level when developing national action plans. The five strategic objectives are comprehensive in nature, given that the actions at country level are complex, and cut across different thematic areas and also different sectors. And as we are here today, one of the, the first um, objective is, of course, improving awareness and understanding. It is where everything starts in our drive to change and combat antimicrobial resistance. The second strategic objective is to strengthen the knowledge and evidence base through surveillance and research. Of course, we need data to inform policy action and to prioritize action at the ground to ensure that we really are addressing the key challenges that each country and district faces, which are often the same, but also different. Thirdly is to reduce the incidence of infection through effective sanitation, hygiene, and infection prevention measures. Fourthly, to optimize the use of antimicrobial medicines. This has already been mentioned many times. And finally, also to develop the economic case for sustainable investment and importantly, also to increase investment into new medicines, diagnostic tools, vaccines, and other interventions that we can continue to treat and prevent antimicrobial resistance infections. And so what countries then did was they basically committed to developing national action plans in 2015. And we as the tripartite have been monitoring the progress at country level since 2017 through what is called the Tripartite AMR Country Self-Assessment Survey. And we're very happy to say that this year, we had the highest percentage of countries participating since the start of the survey, which is 84% of our member states. That is 163 countries. So we're very, very grateful that this also shows that there is increased political attention at the country level as well to AMR. And I would invite everyone here, you can see the link at the bottom of my slide, you can go into the website and filter through the progress by region at a global level, but also importantly, by the country that potentially you are coming from. What the survey does, and it is a, it's a self-assessment survey at country level, it poses questions across the different strategic objectives of the Global Action Plan, 
and then analyzes the responses through the levels of A to E, where if you have indicated that within a certain indicator, you are at level C, that really is our threshold for nationwide implementation. And of course, we want countries to come to C, but also move beyond for sustainable implementation. Of course, we, we cannot complete this presentation without talking about COVID-19. And this year in Trax, we did ask the question on whether COVID-19 has impacted national action plans on AMR. And out of 163 countries, 151 countries did say that COVID has impacted national action plan development and implementation. 134 countries have said that it impacted governance and administrative impacts. For example, as we have heard also from Liz Taylor, the multi-sectoral coordination governance mechanisms, which are so vital for comprehensive coordination at national level, may not have met because perhaps individuals were pulled into the COVID-19 response. And also 128 countries had operational impacts that certain activities that were planned did not go ahead because COVID-19 again probably took over and repurposed the workforce. And so national action plans in total of the corresponding of the countries that reported this year, we're happy to see that 140 countries now have a national action plan. And you will see on this slide, on the right, the progress over the five years. Um, and we have seen a significant increase in countries developing and implementing their national action plans, which is a fantastic. And often these national action plans are either the development is started or they are launched during WA. So again, there's a great opportunity during WA to bring political attention to AMR. This was already presented, but it I think we can always repeat is that given AMI is a multi-sectoral and one health issue, multi-sectoral governance and coordination is key. And this is often brought about by functioning multi-sectoral working groups within countries. And here again, you can see in the progress that there has been an increase in countries reporting that they have a multi-sectoral coordinating committee or a multi-sectoral working group. However, the vast majority, and here you can see they are in, in the B stage, 42% of these countries actually mention that their working groups are not yet functional. So we still have a far way to go. I will now focus on the human health sector and just briefly provide a few additional information that I thought you may be interested in. When we look at the Global Action Plan Objective 1 on raising awareness on AMR and why we are all here and excited for the next few days, is uh, on raising awareness. And the progress that we have actually seen at country level is that unfortunately still, the vast majority of countries only report that they have limited small scale awareness campaigns. And we really need to move countries towards having nationwide campaigns with government commitment and messaging to all relevant stakeholders. And that's why all of you are so vital in your countries at the regional at the global level to spread the message on the importance of taking action on antimicrobial resistance. When we look at the Global Action Plan Objective 2 on AMR surveillance, this is actually where the majority of action has taken place over the last five years. And this also comes with increased interest, capacity building. And what is great is that it increases our evidence base to really inform policymaking. And so we have seen, and as you can see, most countries are in, in D, is that most countries have a national AMR surveillance system and are collecting data nationally. So this is fantastic. When it comes to Global Action Plan Objective 3, an IPC on human health care, even despite, and we may see improvements in, in the reports next year, but even with the increased in attention to infection prevention control during COVID, we still see very little change actually at country level on implementing national infection prevention and control plans. And infection prevention has been mentioned by many of the speakers is one of the key aspects in preventing AMI happening in the first place. Basic hand hygiene, having running clean water and sanitation are incredibly vital in all healthcare facilities. 
So we still have a far way to go. When we look at GAP objective four on optimizing the use of antimicrobials in human health specifically, and this is really where appropriate prescribing, behavior change of also of the consumers not to demand antibiotics when you don't need them or other antimicrobials, we also here have not seen a lot of change. A slight increase of countries that are in level C to E, which means that antimicrobial stewardship plans, treatment guidelines are being implemented in some healthcare facilities, but we really need the guidelines that also Liz Taylor mentioned to be based on local evidence and implemented at all levels of healthcare, because we often don't have the diagnostics to be able to provide data on appropriate prescribing. And so in summary, the, the data that TRACS has shown us for the multi-year responses, there are some very strong and positive messages where countries have significantly, all countries reporting, moved from lower levels to higher levels from A and B to C and E. But there are also areas that have stayed rather stagnant where we really need to increase awareness and attention to. And so as I had mentioned, National Action Plan development, it's been fantastic the number of countries that have now moved to developing their national action plans. However, we really still need to accelerate comprehensive implementation, importantly financing, really looking at leveraging domestic financing to implement those plans and then of course to monitor. Having multi-sectoral working groups at national and sub-national level, we need to operationalize these groups. When it comes to national surveillance systems, it is great to have data, but we also need to ensure that we analyze the data. And what is important is also to look at the data that is coming from the bugs, the antimicrobial resistance data, together with the data on the use of antimicrobials to inform decision-making. And then areas where there has been less movement and where we really need to have particular attention is on raising awareness and why this is very, very, very important this the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week is we need to move countries towards nationwide government supported antimicrobial awareness campaigns that target all key stakeholders, often with different messaging. Um, we need to establish systems to collect the use. How much are we actually using antimicrobials and which antimicrobials are we using? Because only then can we also change some of the prescribing behaviors. We need to implement infection prevention control national plans in all healthcare facilities. And finally, when it comes to optimizing the use, we need to adopt the aware classification that Liz Taylor also alluded to, access watching reserve classification of antibiotics into the national essential medicines list to guide prescribing. And we need to implement antimicrobial stewardship activities in all healthcare facilities. And with that, my final slide is just to mention that when looking at the implementation of national action plans, it is a continuous process and we call this the six steps for sustainable implementation of national action plans. Strengthening governance, prioritizing activities based on evidence and the resources available, costing the operational plan, identifying funding, resource mobilization where funding is still needed to sustainably implement the prioritized activities, and last but not least, to monitor and evaluate and to start the process again. And with that, thank you so much for your attention and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for your presentation, Dr. Pauline. We have a few questions for you. Uh, this is a question from Norul Islam Hasib, special correspondent, Bangladesh Post uh, from uh, Dhaka. Uh, he wants to, that, uh, can you share any successful political actions taken by world leaders to control the spread of AMR particularly in the context of global leaders group on antimicrobial uh, uh, resistance. And he says that because our country's prime minister is one of the co-chairs of that group. So any successful examples to share? Thank you. I think um, just the creation itself of the global leaders group is already a success in its own right because it, it shows that there is global political commitment to antimicrobial resistance and we need 
to then distill this to countries perhaps where political commitment is still, is still lacking. So I think for me, two of the key pieces really is, is that awareness raising political commitment that is being accelerated through the work of the Global Leaders Group that is, is of course being co-chaired by Bangladesh and Barbados. Um, but I think the other and also very important piece that um, they are working on is also looking at sustainable financing actually of AMR because, and I didn't mention it specifically in the presentation, but when we look at national action plans, I mean, political leadership is one important aspect. The second important aspect is actually being able to implement because you have the resources and the financing to do so. But up until now, only 20% of our national action plans are fully costed and funded. And so there is a major gap that we still need to build in terms of being able to accelerate comprehensive um, implementation. And so one of that, and again, it's a key piece of the Global Leaders Group, is sustainable financing of AMR at all levels. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is another question from Maya Joshi, who's a Hindi correspondent from India. And she has sent this question to me in Hindi, and I'm just reading the translated version of it. Uh, that interagency coordination, even within health sector, is often a challenge. To stop AMR, we need so much interagency coordination with food systems, animal health, human health. Are we engaging different ministries, departments, and other stakeholders in designing and implementing national action plans? Or is AMR control going to be a vertical program? Very good question. And I will start with the very end. AMR should not be a vertical program, given that it is incredibly cross-cutting, as you had just mentioned. An action in AMR needs to be taken in various sectors, but also within the human health sector, in different national plans and policies and programs, and also funding. Um, there are elements of antimicrobial resistance response within primary health care response, within the universal health coverage agenda, within pandemic preparedness. And as you mentioned also, of course, within the One Health aspect, within food safety. And so I fully agree that um, intersectoral uh, coordination is incredibly vital, but also incredibly challenging. And what we really are trying to, to push, and we will have guidance coming out as well um, early next year, is the involvement of everybody from the beginning. And this is important when countries in particularly now have an opportunity in revising the national action plans, is to bring together all of the relevant sectors in what we say is that multi-sectoral working group. And that that working group links to existing other committees, such as if there is already a One Health Committee in place, if there is a committee on emergency preparedness, that there are linkages drawn. But also importantly, when, when talking about action within one sector, we also advise that then there are technical working groups, the ones who are actually the technical aspect, the implementers, I would say, that these, for example, a technical working group on antimicrobial stewardship or optimized use, that they include all of the different departments that are working on elements such as substandard and falsified medicines, the essential medicines list, antimicrobial stewardship programs in healthcare facilities, access and supply chain of antimicrobials. So they all need to be brought together at the table that we also see the interdependencies of interventions do not duplicate because we don't have the resources to duplicate. We just don't have it. And that we also are able to implement comprehensively. So although it is not easy, it is vital to have intersectoral coordination that is effective and that actually people are meeting around the table on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we look forward to comments from Thomas. Thank you again, uh, and a very warm uh, thanks to Sarah for presenting that so beautifully. Um, and I think explaining the need for integrated national action plans. And I just wanted to highlight, you know, the opportunity that all of you as journalists have, which is during this wow week to contact the ministries, particularly a Minister of Health, uh, a Ministry of uh, Livestock, Ministry of An uh, Agriculture, and ask questions about AMR, and they would be preparing themselves to celebrate this week. They will also have events. So, you know, covering the events in your own country uh, and getting interviews with the permanent secretaries or the ministers 
would really make a difference so that you can communicate what they are doing about AMR. And you can ask them questions about the five gap objectives and how are we in this country doing in terms of progress against those objectives? How far is our national action plan progressing? I think those would uh, help develop some kind of uh, interaction on AMR with the media and with people. So I really invite you to probe this uh, further with them. Uh, thank you. And uh, uh, you had mentioned uh, about the funding and the shortage of funds, which was a very important point, Dr. Pauline, because there is a question from uh, Ellis Tembe uh, from uh, Eswatini, and she says, uh, how far does WHO go in funding NGOs to increase community public awareness and education on AMR? And with limited resources, government health department is focusing on basic healthcare delivery and AMR is not really a priority for them. What can be done to bring it on top of agenda? Two questions. Thank, Thank you, two, two very important questions. Mm -hmm. But the first one in terms of financing, I mean, what we really are trying to advocate for is, is to leverage domestic financing as much as possible for all aspects of National Action Plan implementation, including awareness raising, because that is the only way that action will be sustainable and, and not solely donor driven. So I would, and my response there would be really to see where you can leverage domestic financing. When it comes to limited resources, I think this is the case in all countries and then you countries need to prioritize where action is taken. And my, my comment here would be, is to raise awareness of your political leaders as, as Thomas was just mentioning on the importance of tackling antimicrobial resistance now, because if we lose effectiveness, of our essential antimicrobials, basic infections will no longer be curable. And this will impact all of the, the advances in modern medicine, which goes then and impacts also basic healthcare delivery. So my, my comment would be here is really to raise awareness of, of the political leadership on the importance of tackling antimicrobial resistance, that we can continue to treat infectious diseases. And also, for example, continue to undertake cancer chemotherapy because without effective antimicrobials, that also will become more and more challenging. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Dr. Kamini Walia, senior scientist at Indian Council of Medical Research, which is India's premier research institute. She's currently leading the setting up of the antimicrobial surveillance network of ICMR and coordinating activities of antimicrobial stewardship program for the entire country. Welcome, Dr. Valia, and over to you now. Thank you, Shobha. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to showcase uh, what progress has been made in India uh, with regard to containment of antimicrobial uh, resistance. And uh, I'm very happy to share uh, the stage with the very eminent speakers uh, from WHO and uh, really grateful for this opportunity. I'll just take a minute to connect my slides. So are you able to uh, see my slides, please? Yes, yes, very clearly, yes. OK. So um, we have heard uh, the previous speakers refer to antimicrobial resistance and why it is so important to contain antimicrobial resistance and how we really need to uh, take the action uh, as of yesterday, actually, we are already uh, late in uh, uh, mounting this response to containment of AMR. Uh, so uh, why is surveillance important? Surveillance actually provides us the evidence. Uh, what is the disease burden in the country? How are the uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, patterns and the trends change, are changing along uh, the time? And that information is not available to us unless we have a very strong uh, surveillance system which can detect these changes uh, uh, in a timely fashion so, so that we are able to launch an informed uh, response based on the evidence. Now, antimicrobial resistance, as the previous uh, speakers alluded to, is a foundation of modern medicine. And that is what scares us the most, that if we uh, have very high levels of antimicrobial resistance and a very thin pipeline of new antimicrobials, which is the uh, case as of today, we might be going back to the pre-antibiotic era. Uh, and as uh, 
mentioned previously, antimicrobial resistance is a direct consequence of excessive use of antimicrobials, uh, which is most of the time uh, done to compromise for poor infection control practices. Uh, this is uh, compromising the gains that many countries made towards control of infectious diseases. We are seeing that happening in tuberculosis. We are seeing that happening in case of malaria. And also, um, now we have a bigger burden of uh, uh, drug resistant infections in community, as well as uh, multi drug resistant infections, which we see in the hospitals, which are also referred to as uh, nosocomial infections, because the drug use in hospitals is very high. So the uh, bugs that uh, people acquire while they uh, during their stay in hospital sometimes is very, very uh, drug resistant, which makes it uh, difficult to manage, which increases the treatment cost. So that's why there is all this discussion about uh, reducing antimicrobial resistance uh, uh, levels um, in the country in, uh, and as well as globally. So uh, it's, it's unfortunate that we are in the times where even a simple cesarean section or um, knee replacement kind of a procedure, uh, it becomes very challenging uh, to handle because of the drug resistant infection, hospital acquired infection that the patient may get. So these drug resistant pathogens are actually invisible threats, uh, which continue to claim invisible victims in our hospitals. The reason I call them invisible is that there is no government system, uh, at least in India, which is recording the deaths due to drug resistant infection. So we continue to uh, remain oblivious of what is the actual burden of drug resistant infections in our country. And during the course of my talk, I will also talk about why it is so difficult to capture uh, the disease burden, which uh, uh, AMR thrusts upon us. Um, as uh, the previous speakers mentioned, a lot of antimicrobial uh, use happens in the livestock and agriculture. So we really need a one health kind of an approach and uh, address antimicrobial uh, use at all levels. This is the national action plan, which India launched in 2017. And as you can see that uh, knowledge and evidence, which is the second pillar of national action plan, it highlights the importance of improving surveillance because um, we can only uh, launch an informed response if we know what is happening on the ground and that evidence comes through a good surveillance system. Now, uh, surveillance uh, data is necessary to understand trends and patterns, but then why was it such an important uh, challenge that India had to, or ICMR had to launch a special um, initiative on surveillance because all the hospitals, uh, they have a clinical microbiology lab and they routinely collect this data. But uh, the challenge is that most of these data comes from small studies or labs or medical institutes, and they don't follow a single uh, standard operating procedure. So that's why there is uh, considerably heterogeneity in the data as it is collected. And because of these methodological limitations, we can't have a nationally representative data or nationally uh, representative trends of antimicrobial resistance. There are lack of patient safety programs in our country, and we need a one health approach uh, in terms of consolidating the evidence too. Uh, for the purpose of my talk, I will be restricting my uh, uh, information to the human aspects of AMR surveillance. And we have two networks in the country. Uh, that is the NCDC network, which is operational in uh, 20 hospitals. And this is the ICMR network. Uh, this is uh, functional in 30 hospitals across the country. And I will be talking, focusing on this particular network and how it is moving forward. ICMR is a, a medical research uh, organization. It's a nodal medical research organization in India. And uh, the mandate of this network is to continue to monitor the trends and the patterns of AMR in the country. And we use, uh, we focus on these six pathogenic groups, the Enterobacteriaceae, gram-negative non-fermenters, enteric fever organisms. Uh, then um, enteric fever essentially is the salmonella uh, typhoid. Then the diarrheogenic organisms, which are, uh, because of uh, which which is a um, which cause cholera and other uh, diarrheas, uh, bacterial diarrheas, then gram positive infections, including uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus and enterococcus and fungal pathogens. We work with the 20 tertiary care hospitals across the country, and we also work with few private hospitals, uh, as well as the standalone uh, laboratories. We publish this data every year. 
So what does the ICMR initiative look like? What uh, Once you capture uh, this surveillance network was started in 2013 uh, with the mandate to capture the trends and the patterns, do the phenotypic and genotypic characterization, improve the quality of data uh, to uh, monitor if there is any uh, outbreak or what kind of transmission dynamics are working. On this in, uh, network, we also built two more initiatives. We are also training these hospitals which participate in our surveillance programs. We are strengthening them for infection prevention and control practices. And also uh, we are helping them establish the structure and process of implementing antimicrobial stewardship. Now these two components are very important. As uh, Elizabeth mentioned in her talk, most of the time the antibiotics are prescribed to compensate for poor hygiene and sanitation practices and this happens very often in our hospitals where IPC is compromised. So unless we improve the infection prevention and control practices in a hospital, we will not be able to reduce antimicrobial prescriptions because the physicians will continue to prescribe. And the second very important aspect is to uh, rationalize and uh, train the doctors to prescribe responsibly. And that comes from the trainings on antimicrobial stewardship. So this is uh, what ICMR uh, initiative looks like. It is a multi-layered initiative. And uh, we publish this uh, data every year. And this is the 2020 data, which was uh, brought out uh, two, three months back. What we see is that India has a very large burden of gram-negative infections. Since this data is coming from tertiary care hospitals, so I would uh, imagine this has kind, uh, some kind of a bias to the data because most of the data is coming from the ICUs of the tertiary care hospitals. Nevertheless, uh, ESBL rates are very high. Almost 70% ESBLs in E. coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae. Carbapenem, which is one of the uh, 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 drug of uh, uh, choice for very highly resistant infections, we see 30% resistance in E. coli, Klebsiella pneumonia, almost 50%, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa, 25%. But it is the Acinetobacter bomini, which is a very common pathogen which is seen in hospital acquired infections. There is almost 70% resistance to carbapenem. We are seeing <coughs> increasing resistance to colistin. Then Salmonella typhi. We are seeing almost 100% sensitivity to ampicillin, chloramphenicol, and cotramaxazole. Now, this is a very encouraging example. The reason is that these drugs are not used that commonly for last many years. And um, this, this particular pathogen, which had become resistant to these three drugs in 19 and 90s, is now fully sensitive to uh, all the three drugs thereby uh, providing an evidence of the fact that when we stopped using uh, these antibiotics, the uh, organism again became susceptible to this particular drugs. So if we reduce our use and reduce the antimicrobial pressure, we do have a hope that you know the drugs will start working again. Uh, among gram positives, we see almost 40% MRSA from this network. And we are seeing increasing uh, 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 resistance to tigicycline, linozolid, uh, especially in Antrococcus uh, uh, bugs, which is Antrococcus fecium and fecalis. And we are also seeing 30 to 40 percent resistance to caspofungin uh, and fluconazole in uh, uh, fungal uh, infections caused by Candida glabrata and Candida auris. Now, this is a very glaring example how things quickly things change uh, when you in, start um, uh, misusing a drug. Now, there is a drug called ferropenem, which is a oral drug, but it has cross reactivity to carbapenems. So once those drugs are introduced in the country, the uh, level of carbapenem resistance increased from 3% to 40% just in a matter of six years. So this is how, uh, when you increase the use of certain drug, uh, it actually uh, is very detrimental to uh, the levels of drug resistance in the community as a whole. Uh, this is referring to one of the speaker's question who said, I did not have amoxicillin, how did I develop this resistance? So uh, if we look at these four bugs, which we most commonly see in um, uh, in different uh, hospital settings, we see that there are different mechanisms of resistance that they possess. 
and it is very difficult to decide how to treat these uh, uh, these pathogens which have multiple mechanisms of resistance which we are able to figure out because we carry out the genotypic characterization now this is uh, from the covid patients we saw a lot of uh, klebsiella pneumoniae acinetobacter and e coli infections in covid patients who were hospitalized for long time uh, similar kind of drug resistance uh, genes the ndms which is predominantly seen in india it is followed by uh, oxa 48s and these are the different drug mechanisms uh, drug resistance mechanisms almost 35% of the patients had polymicrobial infection uh, means more than one uh, bug was causing infection and 8% had both fungal and the bacterial infections lot of broad spectrum antimicrobials were used in the covid patients which who were hospitalized so um, it is actually a bigger uh, uh, epidemic which will unfold uh, in india next year onwards because it takes at least some time for uh, the effects to be visible so uh, that's why i think this week uh, 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 antibiotic awareness week we should uh, try to create as much awareness about restricting the misuse of antimicrobials as we can now uh, everyone has alluded to the integrated surveillance the one health surveillance we recently published the challenges that uh, uh, a country like india faces in implementing uh, antimicrobial resistance we have uh, initiated uh, country wide whole genome genome sequencing based surveillance of carbapenem and colistin resistant e coli and klebsiella pneumoniae in two sites in india and we will see how we uh, go forward but there have been some encouraging developments at the regulatory uh, side uh, we have been able to ban the use of colistin as a growth promoter uh, in the country uh, colistin again is used to uh, treat uh, the uh, um, carbapenem resistant infections so uh, we ca can't afford to misuse this drug and lose this drug too so the government has banned its use as growth promoter in the livestock and the animal sector uh, we have also now uh, set limits for antibiotics and antibiotic residues uh, which are used in the chicken or in the seafood uh, we are also monitoring the antibiotic residues in the milk and the poultry we have been able to ban some of the inappropriate combinations of antimicrobials which were available in the market so the regulatory space has been uh, fairly encouraging and sensitive on uh, this regard uh, now what are the lessons that we have learned uh, so far there is a sampling bias in the way data is presented uh, the tertiary care data is over presented and the reason for that is that most of the labs are only located in the tertiary care and the district hospitals and the lower hospitals do not have any labs that's why there is a dearth of data there are not enough blood cultures which are collected because blood cultures are expensive a clinicians are not encouraged to uh, collect blood uh, cultures uh, also there is a clinician deficit on the test results because of the quality of the lab the quality of the results sometimes uh, which stems from the lack of standardized protocols <clears throat> the most important uh, reason why we do not have uh, disease burden data from india is the lack of uh, hospital management uh, and information systems and uh, that's why we are not able to link uh, uh the patient outcomes to the drug resistant infections this we are trying to address in icmr now and maybe in a year or couple of years we will have this data as well we were able to bring that out for the covid patients where we saw more than uh, 60 to 70% mortality in patients who acquired uh, uh drug resistant pathogens during their stay in hospitals EMR surveillance is very hard to sell to clinicians and policy makers which because it requires a lot of investment not just in terms of financial investments in terms of capacity building at all levels of healthcare so that you are able to uniformly capture that data but then there are some uh, tools and enablers which have become available recently or will become available during the course of time which makes uh, us optimistic that we will be able to uh, uh, sustain this momentum on uh, expanding this uh, amr surveillance across the country there are now standardized uh, procedures the quality assurance system in place uh, improved diagnostics especially poc diagnostics can give a big push to this particular initiative because so far we only uh, have to depend on microbiology labs and the availability of labs is limited but then government of india has taken few decisions 
um, which if uh, they go well, they we will have laboratories even the district at the district hospitals. Then we can also look at uh, the research labs uh, who are generating uh, some data for the purpose of surveillance and uh, definitely designated funding and um, st strength and engagement with the policymakers and hospital administrators will go a long way in um, supporting uh, countrywide uh, surveillance. Now, this is the initiative that I was talking about where uh, government of India has uh, launched an initiative that every district hospital will have an ID block. So uh, th this is a very encouraging development and we have already recommended from national essential diagnostic list that every district hospital should have the culture facility, whether it is automated or uh, the manual facility. So um, all these developments, I think they augur very well with the overall um, aim of strengthening surveillance so that we know what is happening at the level of the community. We know what is happening uh, uh, at the PHC level also. So uh, that's why it is very, very important that we uh, strengthen all the uh, levels of health care for, for this purpose. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Walia. And you've shared some very encouraging news about how we can, say, make a microbe resistant by stopping use of that particular uh, drug. Uh, so that is one thing which, is, which has come out very well, which struck me, at least in your presentation, very strongly. Uh, and I now invite Dr. Ishwar Gilada, a globally acclaimed HIV expert. And Dr. Gilada was the first doctor to raise the alarm against AIDS in India uh, in 1985. He's also president of AIDS Society of India, and he's going, also going to share some very important news uh, uh, in the lead up to WAV. Wow. Over to you, Dr. Gilada. Uh, thank you very much, Shubhaji, for this introduction. In the galaxy of speakers and experts, I'm not uh, claiming to be a very big expert in the infectious diseases. I'm a basically no wise, but I realize that everybody of us should contribute uh, in whatever way we can. Uh, while I'm sharing the uh, presentation, okay. Uh, can you see? Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, I belong to four different organizations. Uh, Unison is my clinic, AIDS Society of India, of which I'm a president, International Aid Society, of which I'm a governing council member, and Organized uh, Medicine Academic Guild. This is a, a conglomerate of 15 different professional organizations, which are professional organizations in the field of postgraduate medicine. So uh, we represent almost 250,000 doctors in the country. Uh, now when we look at why it is important, because we have limited antibiotics, we don't have n number of antibiotics. Still limited, uh, uh, more than that, we have limited antivirals. No one has seriousness, no preserving uh, uh, antimicrobial or antimicrobial stewardship is there. Uh, who should be blamed and who should take a call? That is also an issue. Stigma associated with the place of origin, like uh, sometime Indian superbug in London found. So because of that issue, nobody wants to talk about it. And if you look at uh, the graph of last 100 years, we have last 30 years, not a, any new antibiotic class has come. Though we have carbonamibinum, but the, in the existing class. So new class of antibiotics are not there. So we have limitation over there. And look at all the issues. Every time there's a newspaper heading, um, uh, MDR TB, MDR HIV, a lot of other drug resistance is coming. But we do not see a, a war footing um, a moment to stop them. Infectious diseases, they, they are the leading cause of death in India. India is the world's largest consumer of antibiotics. Now, when we say largest or second or third, India being second in population will be second, third or fourth in many problems, many diseases, many crimes, and uh, also making of any uh, products like antibiotics. More than 60% antibiotics prescribed in adult, and uh, they are not required. So uh, 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 indiscriminate use is there. A study in Tamil Nadu shows that 63% of the children were resistant to at least one antibiotic. So when children get resistance, that means you can imagine how much uh, they have been already treated. Uh, out of the 2 lakh infections related to neonatal deaths, 30% attributed to MRSA and ESBL. And 50% of 15% of those undergoing TB treatment have MDR TB. Now you, you, you look at this is a basically uh, PPP is a practice 
policy uh, pharma dependent issue also, also sometimes patient dependent issue so either triple p or four p india the only country with otc now you go anywhere in the world even smallest of the countries you cannot buy antibiotics you cannot buy steroid you cannot buy uh, anything on otc but india you can buy anything not only that rather than strip they can give you two tablets four tablets also lot of quackery and fakery so sometimes we have a lot of quacks we do not know their degrees uh, there's one doctor whose degree was mrsh uh, no uh, it's called um, what do you call city bh i asked him what is city bh he said compounder for 3 years in bombay hospital so they make any kind of deg degrees like that also indiscriminate use by qualified doctors antibiotic stewardship is absent poor patient uh, awareness patient do not know sometimes they come and demand why you are not giving antibiotic and doctors budget so if, if the patient would um, you know uh, ask that i would like to die can you provide me poison doctors don't give but when a patient requ request for a antibiotic or antiviral doctors give uh, adult immunization very poor concept only in covid people realize that adult immunization is there is existing though we have at least 10 15 different adult vaccines not been used audits and surveys are very poor engaging policy makers planners administrators pharma and healthcare workers and it is done uh, minimally as a tokenism in covid what we have seen there is a increase of an unnecessary hospital stays so as soon as the oxygen concentration come down to 93 94 people got admitted once people got admitted they got pressurized that there is only one or two bed available in icu would you like to be shifted to icu they were shifted to icu and similarly every stage they were over treated and uh, unnecessary admissions otc and media driven use of antimicrobial even giving source of ministry of health i'll show you this slide stockpiling and self medication as soon as uh, uh, headlines came azithromycin works or uh, doxycycline works people uh, stockpiled and they started using on their own as soon as they started one single symptom of covid or covid related symptom indiscriminately used by doctors so i don't want to spare doctors they have also done the same thing and we have seen candida uh, uh, candida oris which is a fatal condition which is a gift of covid just like mucormycosis so you see this slide uh, the, though it is dated 03 uh, june 2021 even today you open uh, any kind of dts uh, direct to home uh, te television channels for example hathway and starting all these slides come and it says when do you use steroid when do you use antibiotic when do you get hospitalized so if you are educating directly to the home the persons are going to go to doctors they are going to go to and doctors also want to encash that kind of situation so this kind of thing should stop despite writing to the top level in the country it has not been stopped i have been writing since june now you look at this uh, prescription a typical prescription of a, a covid positive person nothing else but a covid uh, rt pcr positive 10 10 different medicines three different antibiotics two different antivirals and they were given all given together so basically there are some solutions there can be some solutions so inculcate a culture of culture of organisms so we, we don't have a culture we we just have a syndromic way of management and that should stop antibiogram uh, what icmr has developed so that should be more popularized involve microbiologists in hospital infection control practices we have n number of qualified md microbiologists but they are not involved in hospital infection practices only in big cities they have a importance of that in other smaller places there is no importance and what i would like you to take home is antimicrobial resistance is yet another pandemic and it will explode any day it will be much which will have much bigger proportion than covid uh, it is man made medical profession driven pharma sponsored and officially or policy neglected calamity we need collective steps with the sense of urgency and we should stop the indiscriminate use of antibiotics like peanuts uh, you take four days or two days or uh, if you feel better you stop the covid 19 pandemic has provided us an opportunity to look relook how abundantly and irresponsibly antibiotics as well as antivirals were used let us derive our lessons from these experiences of covid pandemic and contain uh, contain it before it is too late so basically we do not learn from experience we learn from reflecting on the experience and i think this meeting is also going to be a learning experience for me to some extent thank you thank you very much dr gilada and now we will take up if there are any questions for dr walia and dr gilada uh, there is a question for uh, dr walia uh, 
it uh, uh, yes dr valia there is a question that should drug sensitivity profiling of patients be done routinely in hospitals and i'm sure dr gilada can respond to that question too it is not happening but is it important no it can't be done as a routine procedure how many uh, bugs you will routinely profile a uh, patient for it has to be targeted to a clinical syndrome that the patient is having because uh, all your pathogens depend on uh, what kind of pathogen you are looking for will depend on whether the patient has a uti or a patient has what kind of routine profiling is he referring the uh, person who's asking the question referring to i'm not sure but it can't be done like this uh, uh, if you are looking for for example carbapenem resistant uh, organisms then you have to look for a carriage because you don't want uh, the patient who's admitted and carrying carbapenem resistant uh, bugs to uh, spread that in the hospital that can cause outbreaks so those are kind of things that you then you have to isolate the patient so those are the things in where you uh, undertake this kind of screening but not otherwise okay Uh, there is a question for dr gelada from pakistan uh, wali Hay wali haider wants to know that there is a lot of there is a use of a range of medicines from different disciplines uh, in pakistan also uh, for covid they had like uh, all uh, uh, non uh, 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 not, uh, we can't yeah, say non medical sure. but is, yes but and dr gelada is hiv drug resistance a problem on decline or is it escalating Uh, HIV drug resistance problem is on declining because currently we are using dolutegravir based regimen, uh, which is which uh, resistance profile of uh, dolutegravir is very good. Number one, number two, uh, uh, NACO National AIDS Control Organization has been proactively uh, very active in proper use of uh, ART, and uh, since two thousand four they launched free ART program. Almost ninety percent of the people are treated at ART centers, and only ten percent are in uh, private sector. so uh, currently if you look at uh, different kind of resistance it is between 3 to 5% but because of the dolutegravir and there is another drug called darunavir they have a very good resistance profile and therefore we can always switch on them without doing a resistance profile of any person but that is more expensive than the drug for couple of months time okay okay thank you very much and uh, now i would invite uh, thomas for his comments on this as well no i would just like to thank dr valia and dr gilada for their excellent remarks and i thought i learned a lot having originally you know i come from india originally although i am now in geneva but it's really interesting to see what's happening and the progress that's being made and the challenges that are specific to that but most of all shobha i want to thank you and uh, thank bobby uh, at cns for arranging this i thought it was really informative very useful and i want to invite all the journalists who if they wish to be part of the amr newsletters that who issues if you could write and tell bobby that we can't possibly put you you have to you know volunteer to uh, receive our newsletters so if you can indicate that you want to receive our newsletters you will get them including the one that's coming out tomorrow with all the events about wow and then every day after that and then after that we don't send uh, very often but uh, it's it's useful if you would like to do that so thank you all very much thank you very much and in fact there have been some requests to have this forum when possible for everyone at convenient time this is from uh, papua new guinea from uh, the pacific uh, side and also from pakistan that a regular forum for me, uh, will be good usually we, we go to meet and report but learning is left behind in the hurry so uh, maybe we can uh, uh, have uh, some uh, some sort of a uh, uh, sort of a information exchange and knowledge sharing platform so we can respond to this call after this year's wow uh, when we all go blue and perhaps a media platform on amr for knowledge sharing amongst ourselves as well as from who experts and other country experts uh, could perhaps further our understanding on amr and how it impacts our life so this is just a suggestion which has come from a few people and uh, i think with the help from stalwarts like you all who were present here today as speakers we may give it a push uh, so with this we come to the close of today's session and i'm sure today's global media forum has sensitized each one of us around amr and energized us enough to join forces 
and help create awareness uh, through our work. My sincere thanks to all the speakers for enriching today's session with their invaluable reflections. And of course, to the participants for their very, very active participation. Special thanks to Mr. Thomas Joseph and Dr. Leanne Gonzalez for helping us make the event possible. Stay safe, stay healthy, and goodbye till we meet again. Namaste.